was ready to give up, thinking what can I do? But when I breathe that last time, God's power broke through. And prayer is just as big as God is. Prayer is just as strong. What a great truth that song is. If you want to take your Bibles today while the children are being dismissed to their class in the back. I appreciate so much uh, their uh, being able to learn on their level. We're going to Matthew chapter 7 today. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> we'll look at today a very practical Bible truth, a perhaps misunderstood Bible truth. And uh, I guarantee that each and every one of us can benefit from this today uh, to some level. And so hopefully we'll be able to let the Lord work through his word. There's a parable saying we're going to look at today that Jesus spoke in parables often, gave these uh, stories, and, and sometimes he gave a parable saying, and that's one of the ones we will look at uh, this morning. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. It's from that part of the sermon that speaks about judging others. Now, it focuses especially about the hypocrisy uh, that he was uh, pointing out in the Pharisees and judging others. And so let's look at these verses today, starting at verse number 3 of uh, Matthew chapter 7. And the Bible says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Uh, this, this is where we'll stop reading. We'll look at a couple other verses as we go along, but let's open up this morning's service in a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful again to be here, and I pray you would take your word today, remove me from it, and just present it clearly. May I only say those words that would glorify, honor, and help uh, those here. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In the fall of 2020, not uh, just a few months ago, a week before deer season, Dugan Traversi shot a massive buck at the Timberlake Elk Ranch here at uh, West River. Since it was before hunting season, he removed the buck's head, left the rest of the carcass lay where it was, but he hid the head under a nearby bridge. Uh, five days later, he removed the deer's head and then he, that, uh, to, to keep the, uh, the trophy part of it, and then he posted the photos he had taken on social media. 
his post claimed that he had taken the buck that morning, opening day. The post went viral because it was a massive buck. You can still see the pictures online. It was a great looking deer. The problem was that a day before the social media post, the ranch manager found the headless carcass and was able to identify it. Law enforcement caught up with him, and during questioning, he finally admitted to illegally shooting this buck. The problem was not that he shot a buck. The problem was he did it out of season. Uh, he, in other words, he did not have a license to hunt this buck at this particular time. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, whether or not you and I have a hunting license. Now you say, preacher, that's all right, this doesn't apply to me, I don't hunt. Different kind of hunting we're going to talk about today. I want to ask you about a hunt, or talk to you about a hunting license for splinters. And look at what the Bible says here, a hunting license for splinters. As Jesus looked at the religious situation of his day, he saw a big problem. The Pharisees and scribes sat <clears throat> in the place of the critic. They were quick to pass judgment on those who did not live up to their expectations. Uh, Jesus, <clears throat> who was a great teacher, did what many good teachers do. He painted a picture for those that he is teaching, and it was quite a ridiculous one. In fact, if you look at the, what the Bible says here in verse number 4, all right, let's go to verse number 3, sorry. Why beholdest thou <clears throat> the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that it was in thine own eye? Maybe we've read this so many times that we don't stop to consider it, but I guarantee the people in Jesus' audience that day probably got a good chuckle from when he said that. Because it sounds like a scene out of a comedy sketch. You're trying to pick out a little splinter out of somebody's eye. Meanwhile, you have a giant beam coming out of your own eye. Every time you turn your head, people around you have to duck or get conked in the head. This is the type of picture that Jesus is painting here. And so he may have used this illustration because he was a carpenter. It was certainly familiar to him and it would be to those around him. But I want to look at the terms to help us understand what he's asking here. And that's what we'll look at first, the terms in the parable. Uh, to help us better understand, it can be categorized in two groups here. The terms about the objects and then the terms about the observation. Looking first at the objects, two terms are used here. Uh, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? So the two objects here are mote and beam. These two terms speak of the same thing in different sizes. Important for us to recognize that in this parable saying. Uh, the original word for moat means a dry stalk, a twig, or a splinter. It's a very small piece of wood. The original word for beam in the Bible means, you ready for this one? Beam. I think we can wrap our minds around that one. We all know what a beam is. It's a giant big beam. It's a, a often across the ceilings or, or a used uh, in building. They represent extremely different sizes, again, of the same thing. There's a big difference between a splinter and a beam, but both are made of wood. Now, looking at the terms about the observation, and here I want to go to school for just a minute. We'll put our thinking hats on and do a word study. That will help us understand this better. The terms that are used here are in verse 3, beholdest, considerest, and then see clearly in verse number 5. The first term in chapter 7 here, verse 3, is beholdest, comes from the Greek word blepo. It means to see or to have sight. That's a pretty simple just sight word, beholdest. You're able to see. The second term uh, considerest comes from a Greek word that means to understand or to consider attentively. The third term in verse 5 is see clearly. That is a translation from the Greek word diablepo. Remember, beholdest was blepo. Diablepo is to see clearly. The preposition dia gives the sense of thoroughness to the word, to see thoroughly, to see clearly. You see, there is such a thing as a hunting license for splinters. 
there is a time when we can actually point out the splinter in our brother's eye. Uh, but what's condemned here is that a person who points out a sliver in someone else's eye while they have a giant beam in their own eye, it's talking about hypocrisy. Uh, giving no attention to the problem here, but putting attention on the problem there. That is what Jesus is addressing here. Additionally, we understand that if I want to help pick out the splinter or the moat in Brother Corey's eye, I'm going to have to get the beam out of my own eye just so I can see to do the job. That's what Jesus is talking. How are you going to see clearly when you've got this giant beam in your own eye? So you certainly cannot see clearly if that is there. The principle that's here is that correction takes better sight than detection. Amen? Correction takes better sight than detection. Detection is easy. Anybody can stand by on the sidelines and find fault. Anyone can criticize, and many do criticize, but few can correct the problem. It is much easier to be critical than it is to correct the problem. That's the point being made in this passage. If you can do nothing to help the problem, then criticism will only aggravate the problem. So then, going past the terms, let's look at the travesty in the parable. The parable saying begins with the word, why? And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? The question, why, is being asked because what is happening is not rational behavior. A man with a beam coming out of his eye saying to a man with a splinter, hey, buddy, you got something in your eye. Now think about how ridiculous this is when Jesus is given the illustration. <clears throat> the parable describes the sin of hypocrisy very accurately. It is wicked behavior, and it is also absurd behavior. Jesus describes sin differently than men do, by the way. Uh, if you want to see the accurate picture of sin, we look at the Word of God. Uh, we don't look at society. Society certainly does not give us an accurate view of right and wrong, do they? In fact, the Bible says that uh, to behold when men call evil good and good evil, that's certainly happening in our day and age today. But Jesus shows sin for what it really is. And in this parable, he does not, it, uh, he does not cover up the sin, dress up the sin. He exposes it. So the world won't give it to us, but the Bible always will. Jesus shows us that hypocrisy is wicked. We know that. I think we'd all agree with that. But then he exposes how absolutely ridiculous it is. Look at what he says in verse number 1. We kind of start out with this uh, premise in verse 1. Uh, we didn't read it in our, when we read our text, but I'll read it now. Verse number 1 of chapter number 7. Judge not that ye be not judged. The world uses that verse a lot. The world loves that verse. It is used by people who have no earthly idea what Jesus is saying when he says it. The, it conveys the idea, or, or people that misuse the verse will convey the idea, you live your life and I'll live mine. You have no right to tell me how to live. Don't judge. This is probably the most well-known verse in the Bible by unsaved people. Now, Christians, the, it's been documented and obvious that the most well-known verse in the Bible worldwide is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave the... Uh, I guess I don't know it that well. Before he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, John 3, 16, somebody said... Uh, if, the, if we had none of the Bible but the book of John, we'd have enough to go to heaven. If we had none of the Bible but the uh, chapter, three, excuse me, chapter 3 of John, we'd have enough to go to heaven. If we'd have nothing but the verse, John 3.16, we'd have enough to go to heaven. And how true that is. But I don't believe that's the most well-known verse among unsaved people. Among unsaved people, they love Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. Judge not that you be not judged. This is the verse that many unbelievers will memorize. In this verse, they have found or believe they have found a bulletproof vest 
that prevents any Christian from questioning their behavior. You can't say anything to me because the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. I think this is the devil's favorite verse. Just my opinion because it's used so much. A teenager rebels against her parents because of all the rules. They say she can't go out with a certain boy because he's not a Christian. So she storms out of the room and screams, judge not that you be not judged. Is that what this verse is talking about? Not at all. A Bible college student gets drunk and has to be disciplined. His friends rally around him and suddenly become very biblical. Judge not that you be not judged. Is that what this verse is talking about? Not at all. Jesus is not teaching us that we are not to judge at all. That's not what he's teaching us here. If you remember, uh, Doc Hillitable, when, when he was teaching in the top prophecy conference, brought a, made a big point of how important context is. And it is. Every time you look at anything in the Bible, you look at what's around it and what they're talking about and why they're saying what they're saying. If we cannot judge, how do we do what it tells us to do in 1 John 4, 1, when it says, try the spirits? If we cannot judge, then, how, then we can't have courts that can determine and judge uh, criminal behavior. If we cannot judge, then how can we correct our children? If we cannot judge, then how does an employer give out a promotion? You understand we could go on and on and on. Our daily life requires us to judge. In fact, Christ tells us to judge in John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to appearance, he says, but judge righteous judgment. We all make decisions every day that involve other people. We all pass judgment on appearance, on behavior, on speech, on attitude. Let me tell you how judgmental you are, and you even pass it on to your children. You tell your children not to listen to certain adults just because they drive a windowless van and claim to have candy. And you tell them, don't listen to them. Don't obey what they say. Now, I know I just described Pastor Forsberg's van. That was not my intention. But we're so judgmental. We say, don't get into that van. With, don't listen to what they say. Listen, judging people is part of our daily life. It's just part of who we are and what we are. We need to understand that's not what Jesus is talking about, that we never judge. But he tells us in this passage how not to judge says, judge not, and then he goes and tells us how not to judge. We, are, we all judge people. It's just a part of who we, we have to. If, if you're a young lady, you're babysitting, and you hear a, a noise at the door, and you look out through the peephole, and there's a guy with a ski mask and a crowbar out there, you know not to open the door. Why? Because you're judgmental. You're judging the situation. It's, all, it's a part of our daily life. So from this parable saying, we're going to see four lessons on how not to judge. Understanding that there is such a thing as a license. And we'll get to that if you stick around to the end. Uh, so how not to judge. Do not judge, first of all, hypocritically. This is the obvious lesson from the parable. It's easier to judge others than it is to improve ourselves. Let me say that again. It's easier to judge others than it is to improve ourselves. It addresses the need, uh, this parable does, addresses the need of character to qualify us to judge others. Not everyone is fit to reprove others, especially those who are guilty of the same sin. The Bible talks about a beam and a splinter, both made out of the same material. Uh, the hypocrite rebukes the same sin that is in himself, but he rebukes it in other people, and often the sin is less in their life than it is in his own. That's the hypocrite. If you've parented, you know this is true, whether you admit it or not. What drives you craziest about your kids is when they act like you. Amen? It's a secret, but we know it. When they act like you, it drives you crazy because that's what bothers us the most is things that we're often guilty of. And the hypocrite will attack and will try to pick the splinter out in somebody else's eye when they've got the same problem, often even in a greater quantity. Critical people criticize others for faults that are more prevalent in their life than those that they criticize. Now, there's actually a term for this. 
uh, professionally speaking, because it's such a problem with people. It's called psychological projection. The definition of that term is unconsciously taking one's unwanted emotions or traits they don't like about their self and attributing them to someone else, while at the same time ignoring their own sin, even though it's a giant beam. That's the idea of psychological projection. By the way, the critic is not really opposed to sin anyway. Because if a critic is really opposed to sin, they'll be just as opposed to it in their own life as they are in someone else's life. And so we need to be careful that we don't just get an attitude of the, being a critic. Uh, you see, sin blinds the sinner. Oh, it's good for us to remember that because it happens in our own lives as well. Sin blinds the sinner. Especially, sin blinds the sinner to their own sin. Pride is a great example of this. Pride is that sin that said it makes, it makes everyone sick except the person who has it. Pride. Everybody knows it except the person who has it. It addresses the need. Uh, it, 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 this, this, this parable here points out and shows us how important it is for us to recognize the inward sin before we look at outward sin. But pride, by the very nature of pride, we don't recognize it when it's in our own life. The, the, really, the only people that don't struggle with pride are probably the people that think they have pride. And so they're, they're trying to keep it out of their life as much as they can. Uh, you, I always get a chuckle out of the uh, story about the preacher who got a... He was so humble. pastor And the church was so happy. Their pastor was so humble. So they gave him a pin. The world's most humble pastor. And uh, just to honor him. And so the next week, though, they took it away from him. Because he wore it. You see, as soon as we realize we're humble, we're not humble anymore, are we? Pride sneaks up on you. And so pride has this... Uh, by the way, can I ask you this question? And, and you might understand where I'm coming from. Why is it that my dirt is never as dirty as your dirt? Isn't that the way we think? My dirt's not as dirty as your dirt. Your dirt's really dirty. My dirt's just kind of dirty. <laughs> That's how we look at ourselves. And Jesus is attacking that right here. Look, friend, he's saying, you got a beam in your eye. And you're worried about somebody's splinter? You don't have a hunting license for that. You can't go after that splinter until you take care of your beam. And uh, my sin never seems as sinful as the sin of others. But I love this statement. I don't know who made it. He is no enemy of sin who does not hate it in himself. So Jesus is telling us, don't use some standard with others that you don't apply to yourself. Hypocrisy is being strict with the sin of others and lax toward our own. Jesus is telling us here, we are unqualified to remove the speck out of our brother's eye if we have a beam in our own eye. Romans 2, 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, thou, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Strong verse. It is foolish then for someone to judge others for a very sin they commit themselves. In this way, uh, Jesus says, do not judge and don't judge hypocritically. That's the first way we are not to judge. Secondly, do not judge high-handedly. Look at verse number four. Two words here. Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me, that those two words, let me, shows an intrusion into an area of judgment that we have not been assigned. If our own character uh, is defective, beam in the eye, then we have no business judging someone else. We are also disqualified from judging if we have no authority in that area. Let me explain this a little clear. I am your pastor. If you're a member of this church, it is my God-given duty to call you out when you're doing something that's sinful or doing something that's wrong. Now, it is not pleasant. Many people in today's churches, let me just give you an inside track. Most people in today's churches feel perfectly qualified to call out the pastor or his family, but as soon as they call them out, whoo, we got a big battle on our hands. But the Bible sets it out just the opposite. As your pastor, I am required uh, by God to... Uh, shepherd you in those areas. 
So if I see undealt with sin in your life, it's my duty to address it. But if there's another pastor in the state somewhere, and he's doing something I disagree with, and by the way, there are pastors and <laughs> other pastors that do things I disagree with. You know what? I don't say a word to them. I'm not their pastor. I'm not over them. I can maybe have private thoughts or I can have, hey, this is not the way I would do it, but I'm not over them in any way, and so I don't, I don't talk to them or judge them or try to put them in their place. That's not my position. Now, Pastor Forsberg, uh, is, it's, would be a different story. If he started to do something I disagreed with, it would be as, again, his pastor, and we're working together, we'd have to work those things out. I'm just saying stay within your area. Stay in your jurisdiction. We as Christians are really good for stepping outside of our jurisdiction. Herbert Lockyer said we should judge no man unless it be a duty to do so. But then in the church, there are often complainers and critical people who become busybodies. This is also, uh, has a, there's a medical terminology for this too. It's called pneumonia. They sit in the pew and moan. It's an official term, just trust me on it. You could call them spiritual vultures. These individuals thrive on the mistakes of others. Or we could call them moats or splinters. And so like vultures, they fly across the landscape, keeping a close eye out for the failure of others. Then they swoop in for their feast. They involve themselves in areas and matters in which they have no authority. And the Bible is clear. We are to judge only those whose duty calls us to judge. We must have a hunting license, if you will. We're not qualified to judge others in every area. For example, if I see you speeding, I can't give you a ticket. Now, my friend Larry Graham would say I couldn't give him a ticket anyway since I drive a Jeep, but couldn't catch him, right? That's what you would probably say. But he, who knows, what does he know? I can't give you a ticket if I see you speeding. Why? Because that's not in my jurisdiction. I could do this to you. Naughty, naughty. Shouldn't have done that. I could give you a disapproving look. I couldn't give you a ticket. My friend Jason could give you a ticket because it's in his jurisdiction. It's not in my jurisdiction, you see. So when it comes to judging, we better, we better make sure that we even have authority in that area. Now you say, well, preacher, then what is my area? I'm glad you asked. Truthfully, your primary jurisdiction is you. You. That's who you judge. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Judging ourselves. Warren Wiersbe said this. Fer Listen to this carefully. It's so good. Pharisees judged and criticized others to make themselves look good. But Christians should judge themselves to make others look good. Now, wouldn't that be a greater environment? What an attitude. So the Bible says here, do not judge hypocritically. Do not judge high-handedly. Thirdly, do not judge gleefully. The, the words here, again, let me, that kind of shows an eagerness to judge. For every action, there is an equal and opposite criticism. Some people find fault, like there's a reward for it. And if somebody has done them wrong, they will eagerly magnify that fault to others. All the while, a beam in their own eye of self, uh, and a self-righteous attitude. Now there's a reminder again, as I keep reminding throughout this message, there is a time we can point out splinters. Leviticus 19.17, the Bible says, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. There are times that we go after splinters. There are times that we point out things in our brothers and sisters in Christ. But preceded in Leviticus 19, it is warnings against slander and hatred. So how then, how do we get a hunting license for splinters? Preacher, I want to go after some splinters. How do I go after it? Well, uh, I'm glad uh, uh, here you asked again because I have three question test for you. I think this will help us. Three questions that determine... If you or I are ready to talk to somebody about their splinter. Number one, do I truly desire the best for the person that I think needs correcting? Number two, am I going to face them, not someone about them, but face them honestly and gently? 
Number three, do I find the task disagreeable or am I secretly getting some pleasure out of it? I think that we know which answers are right and which answers are wrong. Don't judge hypocritically. Don't judge high-handedly. Don't judge gleefully. And then finally, do not judge inaccurately. So here the Bible says, once you get that beam out of your eye, then in verse 5, now you can see clearly to help somebody with their problem. Taking motes or splinters out of people's eyes is hard work. Uh, you have, have, you ever, have you ever tried with a child or something? To, they said they had something in their eye. You try to help them get it out, I mean, a little speck of something. It's, it's, You've got you to gotta see clearly. You've got to be able to focus right in on that. It's hard to do when you've got a beam in your eye. So once we get rid of that, now we have the vision to be able to help someone else. This statement here, it is only when we have wrestled with and overcome our own besetting sins that we have the insight and tact to direct others how to overcome theirs. There is such a thing as accurately judging others. We need it both in correction and detection of sin. John chapter 7 verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. There's a difference between someone who loves you and wants to help you and someone who puts you under a microscope only to find fault in you. I have found that those who are the most critical are often those who have the most problems in their own life. And those who are closest to God and the best relationship with the Lord, they are the ones with compassion and forgiveness. They're kind. They're uplifting. They're the quickest to forgive, the quickest to restore, the quickest to help someone struggling in sin. Now, here, I believe, is God's message for us today. Notice again what Jesus called the judgmental person, verse 5, thou hypocrite. This is when we uh, judge and condemn others without first judging ourselves. The order is very crucial. Number one, first we judge ourselves. Number two, first we're hard on ourselves. First we ask the Lord to show us our sins. Until that, we can only see specks and we cannot see beams. We cannot see logs in our own <coughs> eyes. But once we allow the Holy Spirit to do surgery within our own hearts, once we have confessed and repented and mourned over our own sin, then and only then, my friend, are we ready to help others with their motes and their beams. Only then can we get a hunting license for splinters. Now, how do we know We've reached that point. How do you know you're ready for your license? Well, let me make a few statements and then give a couple of signs here too. But number one, this, this, is, this, is the, this is the clincher right here. Your own sins will bother you more than their sins. Now think about that. Because a person, a, a, a hypocritical person, a judgmental person that Jesus is trying to avoid, focuses, all they think about is their sins. Oh, that type of person they are, what they've done, what they've said, and not even thinking and considering our sin. You are not ready for a license until you've come to the point where your sins bother you more than their sins. Here's what evangelist George Whitfield, he was often accused by his enemies. He was, uh, anytime you, are, uh, you, know, you have a large work like he did, you're going to have a lot of criticism. And one time he received a vicious letter accusing him of wrongdoing. And Evangelist Whitfield, this was his reply. And I quote, I thank you for your letter. As for what you and my other enemies are saying against me, rest assured I know worse things about myself than you'll ever say about me. With love in Christ, George Whitfield. When the Holy Spirit works on you, the failures of others won't seem so big to you. But your own will seem monumental. You'll know you're ready to talk about a brother or sister, about a speck in their eye, when you don't want to anymore. <laughs> That's when you'll know you're probably ready. Because now you're not, look, you, you'll have the idea of, Lord, how can I talk to them about that when I've got all these problems myself? Look at me, I'm sinful. I'm, I've got so far to go. I have no right to go to somebody about their problem. Now you're getting into licensed territory. See, critical people never look in. Critical people only look out. 
They are not the problem. It's the teacher's fault. It's the boss's fault. It's the pastor's fault. They never look in. The people who have judged themselves, like it talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, they will display humility, godly sorrow, gentleness, patience, and discretion. Remember David's prayer, David's sin, and then for a year he covered that sin. He tried to live the way he wanted. He tried to go his own direction. Finally, he broke down, and in Psalm 51, we have the prayer. Actually, that's the prayer, but it says something similar to in Psalm 139, 23, when it says, Search my neighbor, O God, and know his thoughts. What the Bible says? Nah. Search me, O God. Search me and know my thoughts. Know me, because you see, a humble person, not a hypocritical, but a humble person, always focuses on their own lacks rather than looking at others. We need to recognize, Lord, it's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I thought once of the man next door and all the sins he had, and I remember feeling good. I was not that bad. And then the Holy Spirit came and showed me all my sins and told me if I got right, revival would begin. I close with this great truth from this parable saying, judge in verse 1, the word judge comes from the original Greek word krino. It is translated condemn five times in the New Testament. Now stay with this, it's so good. The same word is used in John 3.17 for God sent not his son into the world to krino or to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. In John chapter 8, Jesus is approached by a mob pushing a woman in front of him. They have caught her, they said, in the act of adultery. What are you going to do, Jesus? What are we going to do with her? We need to stone her according to Moses' law. And so they pushed this woman in front of them. And had she sinned? Yes, she had. But Jesus did not focus on her sin first. What he did is he forced the men that were bringing her to come to view with their own sin. He started to write on the ground. We don't know what he wrote on the ground, but he wrote enough on the ground that it started to convict the men that were holding rocks ready to throw at this woman. And so he said, then the words we know so well, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And one by one, they dropped their rocks and walked away silently. Why? Because they were forced to face their own sin. You know what Jesus did? He came to this woman, and he did not. Important, he did not justify her behavior. She wasn't, she did wrong, but he forgave her and he challenged her to stop sinning. And he said these words, neither do I condemn thee. Same word as judge in chapter 7, verse 1. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, here's what's really sad is when God's people in God's church put more focus on condemnation with one another than Jesus Christ himself does. And what a tragedy when we become more concerned with other people's sin than we do our own. We become more observant of splinters over there rather than beams right here. And this passage is given to help us battle that tendency. Every one of us have that tendency because we are selfish human beings. We're just made that way. But Jesus is trying to teach us better. Jesus points out that the Pharisee splinter hunters are are in need of inventory more than anything else. Until an inward look is taken, an outward look is impossible. And uh, we ought to do the same in our hearts and lives today. Can I encourage you today, friend, if you struggle in this area, and I think if we're honest, every single one of us do to some extent. Revival begins with an inward look. Revival begins with an inward focus. Lord, where is it in here? What is it in here that you need to change? And then let God change you. Jesus said here, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own? That's the question he began with. The premise he ended with is, Hey, you settle that. Then you'll see clearly. There is a time There is a place, and thank God for the people in my life that have been able to say, hey, let me help you with these different areas. We need that as well. But we first need to deal with what's inside so we can look out. Father, we thank you for this passage. And Lord, I don't know where this hit anybody or everybody in here. But we know, Lord, your word is powerful. 
to change, to divide, to cut asunder the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Lord, may there be some self-inventory, some self-examination in our hearts today. And if there's anything that needs to be settled, we would be obedient in doing so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before she begins to play, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm a child of God. I'm not sure if something happened to me today, I'd be in heaven. Would you pray for me? Slip up your hand and I'll pray for you. Nobody looking around. I won't embarrass you. If you're here today and you're not sure you're going to heaven, let me let a preacher pray for you. Thank you so much. What about you, dear Christian? We talked today about a weighty subject, something that probably every single one of us deals with. If God spoke in your heart today, would you respond? As she begins to play, would you stand along with me, heads bowed, eyes closed, altar is open. If God's spoken to your heart, let's be honest with ourselves today. God wants to deal with you. If you've uh, spoken to your heart, would you respond?